Dear Gülçin, dear Hans, thank you very much for inviting again. But now also I have to do something to earn that invitation. Uh, and congratulations to you, Hans, for your birthday. Bravo. <laughs> yeah, that was it. Thank you so much. Uh, no, no, I see this will be a promotion movie now for 30 minutes. Uh, model is, of course, uh, uh, an amazing name. And, uh, and look at my wife. And uh, she earned it, and uh, I inherited it. And uh, uh, this seems to be the same story also that I have inherited a business. But uh, the story is a bit more complicated. Uh, in my 80s, uh, as a student of economy, I was very much worried. Worried to find new markets. And I was so surprised about this worry. It could mean that I could become an entrepreneur one day. Because when you're worried about markets, uh, it's exactly the worry that you need to uh, probably uh, make your money one day in markets, in free markets. And uh, still for me, the, probably the most surprising event in my life was something that, uh, if I look around, uh, most of you have shared with me, end of the 80s, new markets came up. So the fall of the Berlin Wall uh, meant an opening of new markets. And uh, as I carried this unanswered question in me all these years, it was clear for me that this was the answer, indeed. So after my studies, it was a time coincidence again, uh, I went into consultant business, that is, in your young age, when you are ex unexperienced, exactly the right thing to do, namely to consult other people. <laughs> and uh, I was uh, in, for example, in Potsdam, uh, consulting Wasserwerke, how to transform into a, a market uh, society. I was consulting in the Czech Republic uh, to transform a a sleeping uh, skiing resort into a tourist attraction. So funny enough, that's what I did. And in 91, my father called me, uh, saying that um, he was about to buy a business in France, and he thought I might then manage that business. Well, I was not particularly uh, enthusiastic about France, uh, but uh, when we negotiated the salary, I was convinced. <laughs> I joined the family business. So this logo that you see uh, is indeed a family business that is a bit particular in the sense that it was founded by my grand-grandfather in 1882. And every time I tell this and bring it to my mind, I'm surprised myself how that could happen and how we could survive. You know, this probability of uh, from one generation to the other is about 5% and multiply 5% by 5% by 5%. Uh, of course, you do not end up with 25%, but <laughs> with a much lower <laughs> figure um, that has some zeros after the commas and so on. But it's, it's a fact. And he called me to do that job, and I came into office in 91, uh, and I, it, the transaction was not uh, completed, and I was looking into the case again, and after a study, a deep study of about 43 minutes, a very deep study, uh, I must say, I ran into my father's office to say, bad deal, let's not do it. Let's get out of it as soon as we can. So the price was high and the expectations were low. So 
in a way, I didn't think that I had to study and make a PhD in economics to have that judgment. It was such a clear case. So my father agreed, and it was not the last time that he agreed with my opinion. It took me a couple of months to come out of these contracts that he signed. And he's a good father. I mean, he thought about his son and uh, uh, buying him a company, what a decent thing to do. But this son refuses it, and uh, we managed to go out. And I was a, uh, sitting in an office without anything to do, except to prove it in a different way. So luck came in. So we are still writing the year 91. And we have maybe not a Margaret Thatcher in a power in a country that I was particularly interested, but we had a Václav Klaus, a prime minister in Czech Republic, elected, I think, in the 1990s. And I would give him some credit without really studying in detail. But uh, he wanted to really privatize the state economy as fast as he could. And by coincidence, um, by Salomon Brothers at that time, there was a dossier uh, on, on my desk with this privatization of the industry we are in. So you see out of this O, the logo indeed shows we are in the packaging, we are producing corrugated boxes and folding boxes for consumer industry. So our biggest customers are chocolate, are food and beverage in all kind of uh, brand names. So Václav Klaus at that time was convinced that he would not be re-elected in the parliament election in 1902. So he pushed through as many privatizations as he could. So I'm, I'm stressing this because um, time was a critical factor. So I was sitting there in Prague at the negotiation table with my lawyer, and opposite me were 12 people, uh, six at least from Salomon Brothers, and six uh, ministers and secretaries from the uh, government. And uh, we managed to, to win this global tender, not by money, but by time. So uh, elections were I think it was something about 7th or 8th of July in 1992. And we signed the contract four days before these elections. And this, of course, was not a coincidence. Uh, we were negotiating day and night. And uh, when I set my final price, um, this anecdote I love, I have to share it with you. So I was sitting on this other table. and. Uh, uh, I set the final price, and imagine no reaction on the other side. No, none of all. And of course, I felt a bit embarrassed in such a social constellation. And I was looking to my lawyer, and I was sure I screwed it. After one minute of complete silence, Suddenly, an activity started. Some people were going to the telephone. Others were discussing with each other. And uh, we couldn't interpret. And it remained a rätsel, a unanswered question. But the thing is that a couple of days later, we flew back to Zurich. Uh, the answer was, we made the deal. So we finalized. We negotiated day and night uh, until this uh, I would say two days before the elections. And we signed the contract. And then we went into a pub in Prague. And of course, my first question was, what was this strange reaction after my final offer? And the thing was, they at the same time, they negotiated with an American company called International Paper. And they were so used to the fact that each time he, he mentioned the price, he would run to the telephone and call New York if this would be correct, what he said, and backed up by the board. In my case, uh, it was not necessary. 
let's assume these are the advantages of a family company. So they were so used to that, they thought after I set my final offer, I run to the telephone and call my board. And uh, then they realized I don't do it. And they realized we can do the deal. And we can do it now and not in two weeks' time when uh, Václav Klaus's cabinet was elected out of office. The joke was, of course, he's, he was re-elected to the surprise of everybody. But we had this uh, company, and I tell you this so lengthily, of course, it's not yet a hardship, so to speak, is that uh, this uh, happening gave a lot of tailwind to my career. In 95, I could uh, become CEO of the, this family business, which at that time was purely Swiss-based business. And we were the first company in our business uh, to enter the former Comic-Con markets. And then ownership was the next question. Um, so my father was not the majority owner. There were many uh, shareholders. And uh, so his sister, for example, she wanted to uh, sell her shares. And my father had the next plan. Uh, which I opposed, and that was uh, going public. Um, I didn't like the idea of uh, being a CEO of a public company, uh, so I was running to the banks and uh, asking for credits. The good news was they were uh, prepared to give me money, and the bad news was, uh, but Mr. Model, we at least need a little, little, little equity. So I was running back to my father saying, listen, father, I would get some money. I cannot follow your plan of going public, but please give me something. This is a very difficult <laughs> uh, starting point for negotiations. But uh, he, he invented some uh, conditions, so we found the solution. He said, OK, I give you 2% of the company but uh, you have to waive your inheritance and you have to take your brother with, me, with you, 50-50. I immediately accepted these conditions uh, and I did right so because my father will have his 86th birthday in 12 days. And he is well off and I'm happy for it and I would hate myself uh, waiting for inheriting shares. So that's my little story to come into business. Now Hans asked me for the hardship. And uh, by the way, this is uh, our headquarter, uh, a little private house, so to speak. And uh, probably more, more interesting is the big tree in the back. This tree is a red birch and its age is about the 130 years of my, of my company. So this is not yet the hardship, but this one is. Here I really let down my trousers, but it is, uh, it is referring to the years 2001 to 2006. The title is Daniel and Elizabeth Model Together. And this is a, an official document by my tax uh, consultant. And uh, here you see, uh, so I'm sorry, it's in German. Here you see income, our income together. And here you see a separation. Bund means federal tax. And TG is Turgau. This is the canton. Uh, this is the, the state tax and the federal tax together. So this is, uh, to tell you frankly, my income between 2001 and 2006. Uh, there is a slight increase because Elizabeth joined the company and she had also some income. And here you see the tax, income tax. And here you see the percentage. And this is why Switzerland is uh, thought to be a very uh, attractive country. Income tax, look at it. If you, you have to, you know, aggregate these two figures so you end up 
31%, 33%, and so on. So you are between 31 and 33%, which is compared to Germany, a paradise. Uh, but then the real ugly stuff starts. Here we have wealth. So uh, please admire me. I'm a very wealthy person. So we are talking here of 79 million, 88 million, 90 million, 89 million, and so on. Up here, 2006, wow, we made a jump. We are close to 100 million Swiss francs of wealth. But don't admire me too much. It's a, it's a company value, basically. So we were indeed quite successful, so to speak. So the credits, the, the debts that we, I have taken on uh, to make the management buyout, by that time was about to be paid off and at the same time the company was growing and growing. So indeed uh, we created some value so to speak but then the bad news really comes in and this is the so-called wealth tax. And that's the absolute figure of wealth tax we had to pay, Elizabeth and me, in this period. And this is the percentage of the wealth tax. So it's 0 0.54444. Well, this is, a, this is Zurich is coming in. This is an apartment. But please don't make too many photographs. It's a, <laughs> it's a bit, it's, but it's, it's old data, OK? And uh, so you see. You see the percentage, and in a political debate, you know, in a parliament, they would argue, but Mr. Model, I mean, what is the problem? Sharing 0.5% of your unbelievable wealth with the people, how can you oppose? You must be a very cold-blooded person, <laughs> not being prepared to share with others. Well, uh, the next line is, of course, total income tax and wealth tax, and this is the amount. It's all in Swiss franc, but uh, then we took the amount in percentage of our income. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I didn't have any other income than income. I don't want to go deeper into it. I just can't stand it. <laughs> and you are laughing. I mean, what kind of friends are you? <laughs> so to, to go back to facts, I mean, 2001, basically, I paid all my income as tax. In 2002, that was really <laughs> I paid 123%. Of course, you're. Of course, I, you might ask, how could you pay it? It was a problem. So I went to the tax authorities saying, guys, how, how shall I do it? <laughs> no, I did. I must say, by the way, the good reputation of the Switzerland has, a, beside OK, I mean too high, but comparably OK, percentage of income tax here, you can talk with the people and share your problem. Because Switzerland is still a, a small country. This Canton Thurgau, I am pretty well known, so to speak, is a small entity of 300,000 people. And we employ, let's say, 600 people just in this Canton. So they would accept the date. So I asked them, and you know what their answer was? I think you can guess. You have an idea? It is a possible answer. Uh, they, they weren't really so uh, unpolite. They were very polite, say, but Mr. Model, you should increase your income. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a, it's a true story. I'm not joking. And uh, this is basically what you see here. <laughs> so <laughs> I followed the advice of uh, my uh, robbers. <laughs> uh, here you see 2003, I increased my income quite dramatically. Uh, 
and I could pay. So why, how could I pay? Because the years uh, defer. So uh, I didn't have to pay that amount in that year, but I paid that amount, uh, let me see, sorry, here. The total income tax I had to pay in this year, you see, and I had more income. So just to, to answer your possible question, which you didn't uh, ask, how could you pay it? Well, I shared this sorrow with my beloved wife, with my, our young children, and they didn't believe it. I shared this sorrow with politicians. They didn't believe me. I, I had a discussion with a minister. He didn't believe me. Why? Because the this, this real sin happens, they transform a company into an amount of money. And they would never believe that you don't have that money. Never. No chance. I gave up any discussion about it anyway. So I had the minister in the Canton Thurgau also with me. I told him my sorrow. He didn't believe me and he walked off the table. So, what did we do or what was our solution? Um, we said we do not want to make tax uh, issue the fate of our destiny, so to speak. So we stayed in Switzerland and we said, we, uh, by the way, we were living in a very nice house and uh, so don't, you know, think that our life was, was terrible, it was just bearable. <laughs> so we stayed, we stayed and we moved only three years ago out of Switzerland. And we coincided it with our uh, youngest daughter. Uh, she left the house, a big house, and the house was almost empty then. <laughs> and we felt this was the right moment to move. So we moved to the Principality of Liechtenstein. So that was uh, the first solution to this hardship. And uh, the funny thing is though, uh, we did it so to speak out of tax reasons, but we are much more practical about it because the location Liechtenstein and our headquarter and, uh, and other places which are important for us uh, were an advantage. So uh, after three years, and I really have to look in the eyes of my wife, after three years, uh, we can say we are very happy there. And it has not primarily something to do with money. But we are guests in a country. We do not have to uh, uh, be uh, ärgerlich. So, so in a way, uh, be upset about their politics because the Principality of Liechtenstein also has its uh, troubles and you are more remote from your mother country and you can watch them and you also feel not too much involved in the problems of the daily politics. So it's a wonderful a summary I can make here uh, that we are happy but Switzerland has the same also for foreigners. So I do not want to make here an anti-Switzerland promotion because as a foreigner, you can come into Switzerland and make the same as we did coming to Principality of Liechtenstein, namely negotiate the terms and conditions of a flat tax agreement. And that's what we did. And that's why Switzerland is so highly regarded and recommended all over the world because there are so many privileged foreigners who have a flat tax agreement with Switzerland. The only people who cannot do this are Swiss people being so unfortunate and born in that country. <laughs> Second hardship. Uh, well, this is just an article, I think Hans has read it too, a journalist then a couple of months after we moved, uh, he, he got the information that we moved and I had the, the chance to make an interview and uh, you would love it. 
the second hardship. Well, Switzerland really is famous uh, for last year's uh, policy change of the National Bank. Uh, I'm sure you know that. Uh, they firmly uh, said uh, that they would defend the currency exchange rate at 1.2 uh, Swiss franc against the euro. Uh, to remember all of us, when the euro came out, it was 1.6. So. Uh, Switzerland has this wonderful reputation, except uh, for the slides before, and uh, many people go into Swiss francs. And I just uh, had a chat with a colleague last night. He also has um, even expected that the Swiss franc would strengthen further. Uh, so it was 1.6. Uh, when was the euro born? 2000? Or 99? 2001. 2001. So 15 years ago it was 1.6, so the, the Swiss franc strengthened up to 1.2. At that time, or in this period, we employed 1,000 people in Switzerland alone. Uh, so it gave us quite some hardship, but I do not complain because a strong currency is a good thing, basically. For industry, it is hard, but you you have to invest and, uh, and be a very highly automated modern uh, company and then you can survive. So we have the most modern corrugated factories in Switzerland. Now the shock last year, 15th of January, was tremendous. You can see this in uh, this chart. So this was the uh, all the time defended 1.2 and uh, the management was so able to announce this before the stock exchange opened. So they are not really uh, clever people. Because when they had done it after the stock exchange closed, then at least some people could have slept overnight to think what they should do. Nobody thought anything, but in a shock, the Swiss franc went to a high of 0.85 within seconds. Now, if you have an industry, <laughs> I don't have to tell you much more what's happening then. The next day, our customers called us and they wanted a price reduction, a substantial price reduction, otherwise they would go to non-Swiss suppliers, of course. So at the end of the year, which was last year, the summary was quite disastrous. We lost about 50 million sales. We, and 50% of this loss was price, and 50% was volume. 50 million loss. Uh, out of this currency game. Of course, I am not a fan of national banks. But when national banks change their policy and lose their credibility within seconds, then uh, I must admit it was for me probably more a psychological shock than a real shock. Because at least you can see a little bit it recovered and you know what the the, the funny thing is, Swiss National Bank started to intervene again. Because still, at the end of this year, Switzerland has lost at least 100,000 industrial workplaces. At least 100,000. So they saw that and they started to intervene. I, I would say at the moment, I'm, I'm not up to date, it's 1.08. But still, it is a drop or a rise of, of uh, the value of Swiss franc of 10% within uh, a short period of time. So Swiss National Bank, of course, could have defended that. But I'm not really against their policy change. I'm, I'm against the change of their, or how shall I say, it's a 
they lost self-confidence and they made a shock and of course it costed millions for, for us all. I'm not complaining about this and I must say uh, we are also recovering. So the good news, I have two good news or three of it. That's why I'm a bit hesitant to really call it the hardship. One point is, yeah, it recovered a little bit and uh, we restructured our business. So we are back in, in black figures. So I'm a bit more relaxed today than I was uh, a couple of months ago. We restructured. Uh, we, we took together uh, our four production sites into one company and uh, we reduced workforce also by Elizabeth is responsible for Switzerland 80 80, 80 workplace the second thing uh, I am not so upset is maybe an Austrian school argument if you have a strong currency uh, it's a good thing it's a good thing about value the value, the culture of uh, a society. So the devaluation, the loss of euro value is the real disaster for Europe. And the strong Swiss franc actually is a compliment to the country. I must admit that. And the third thing, uh, well, we made an acquisition. Why? we used our strong currency and we bought a huge company in Germany because the company became 10% cheaper <laughs> by decision of Swiss National Bank. So that was our solution to offset all these losses. We had liquid liquidity in our uh, accounts and we used it to buy in Germany and by this we now have again a very balanced portfolio in the different currencies. I can show you this. Uh, all the yellows are now uh, factories of ours. So we are in Poland in the Sloty area. We are in Czech Republic, our biggest market today uh, with 1,300 people. We are here in the crown area, Swiss franc area and euro area. And now we have a quite a balanced uh, portfolio and I can say um, hardship is probably not such a bad name because it's a hardship. It's a it's a stable ship, it cannot sink so much and uh, we managed to uh, transform hardship into benefits. And just to give you a last hint of our company, these are all our plants. Zack, 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 zack. I'm collecting plants. <laughs> and today we employ 4,200 people, four times more then in the year I could take over. This is a green field in Czech Republic. This is a green field in Poland. This is a green field in Poland. This is our latest acquisition in Poland. And this is the model of where Hans had the first speech after opening my little state. I found it and I hope one day you will join us in the model of a place where you can celebrate libertarian spirit. Some of you have been there and I, Witt was there, Hans was there, many of you and I hope uh, you join with me the optimism that if you overcome hardship you can be very grateful for the hardship, for the resistance they give you. Overcoming the resistance makes you stronger and with this optimism I would like to stop here. Thank you.